I know, it's a bold statement to make about a movie review web series created by this guy. I've got one ninety. I've got seven ninety. I've got sixteen ninety nine. Cheap prices. Fourteen. Two forty nine. Three. But I'll say it. On Cinema at the Cinema is my favorite comedy show of all time. I love this movie. Skip it. You're gonna want to see this one in the theaters. <laughs> it's on Cinema at the Cinema with me, your host Tim Heide. Your son is in hell, Delgado. <laughs> with Victor Bell's Film Center. Great dark and deep bleak surprise. I don't want the ideas from my head to come out that house. Batman. Yep. On Cinema at the Cinema is my all-time favorite comedy show. I feel compelled to make this video to explain why, because despite the devoted cult following this show has amassed over the years, I still feel somewhat alone in my love for it. Nothing I've ever really watched strikes me as this brilliant or makes me laugh quite as hard, and yet I can't really recommend it to any of my friends. I can't recommend it because of two reasons. Number one, the niche humor. This show is specific, insanely specific. If something like The Office or Friends ranks up there with the broadest of comedy offerings, On Cinema would land on the opposite end of the humor spectrum. I'm not making a qualitative judgment, I'm a fan of shows like The Office myself, but On Cinema almost feels like it was made in a lab to personally make me laugh, while almost anyone I've showed it to has had the same reaction. Why is this funny? Not my kind of humor. I think almost anyone, though, who really tried to understand what the show actually is would find it funny. There's a problem, though. Because getting to that understanding isn't as simple as firing up, say, literally any random episode of The Office and immediately understanding what the core joke of the show is, the character motivations, their relationships, everything that makes it funny. This brings me to the next reason it's hard to recommend. The time investment. This show requires so much more work to break into because it continuously builds on itself and so much of the humor requires context of what came before. I try to reference Shrek as little as possible in my life, but in this case it's apt to conjure the metaphor of an onion. From which, while prepping for this video, even after watching it all over so many times, I'm still peeling back layers of irony and humor that maybe I hadn't discovered before. I'll get into this more in detail later, but at this point, the lore of On Cinema runs deeper than almost any IP I can think of. My rough estimation, based on 13 10 episode seasons of the flagship show with average 10 minute episodes, leaves us around 21 hours of content. Add to that 11 live annual Oscar specials at around 2 to 3 hours each, plus 6 seasons of an in universe spy action series, a feature mockumentary, a 5 hour long trial, a number of audio only podcasts, a Valentine's Day special, an in universe scripted feature with its own dedicated post mortem special, a series of TV pilots written by the characters from the show, a dedicated blog updated regularly, as well as hundreds of Twitter discussions and more. This leaves us with well over 70 hours of content. Again, this is a rough estimate, but you're probably starting to see a barrier to entry for anyone looking to get into this show, as this amount of programming can be daunting. So, because of these reasons, I felt compelled to make this video essay. Let it serve as my appeal to anyone watching that this investment is absolutely worth your time, and the ridiculous scope of its universe only contributes to making it one of the most unique and singular pieces of entertainment you can find. <music> In this video, I'm going to break down exactly why I feel so strongly about On Cinema and why I believe despite its obvious barriers to entry for the average person, everyone should give it a chance. If you really look at what the show is doing, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say it's arguably one of, if not the most, layered and interesting pieces of comedy out there. At first introduction, you will see a very simple show with a simple concept, and as you progress into the series, you will realize the core concept is only the very tip of the iceberg. I'll go into detail of what I mean in a moment as we expand out this discussion into the elements that really push this series over the edge for me, but talking about the core concept of the show and why it's so brilliant is a perfect place to start. For the sake of understanding this show without having watched it, it helps to think of this not as a show, but as a parallel universe with alternate versions of its two stars, Tim Heidecker and Greg Turkington. The content these characters make in-universe is primarily how we as the audience interface with them, the main one of which is the web series On Cinema at the Cinema. The foundation of this universe really is its main two characters. You may recognize these names as actors who have played a number of other characters. I'm a chicken! <laughs> punk, punk, punk! You can't go wrong with some sour cream and onions so long as you bring ridged chips. Both of these creators are on a lot of people's Mount Rushmore's of alt comedians. Certainly on mine. And this show is a big part of why. So again, to clarify, On Cinema is essentially a fictional web series created by and starring fictional characters named Tim Heidecker and Greg Turkington, who in real life are played by actual Tim Heidecker and Greg Turkington. Got it? I will get more into this later, but the reason it's important is that this universe expands across mediums and is quickly no longer contained within the confines of the web series format. 
Hence, think of it as watching a diverse slate of content from a parallel universe that's made by fictional versions of Tim and Greg, whose lives we follow through their work. It's almost the opposite setup of a show like 30 Rock, which centers around characters working on a Saturday Night Live style show. The narrative of 30 Rock is shown to us as a scripted sitcom of the behind the scenes of the show. With On Cinema, almost all we see, at least at first, is that show, and the true story of the behind the scenes slips through that format almost accidentally. From the perspective of the hosts of the show, a lot of the actual story is stuff they'd rather the audience not see. Now imagine a version of 30 Rock in which all we see is the actual show they're producing, and as it goes wrong in a myriad of ways live on air, we learn more about the story behind the scenes. This is essentially how On Cinema tells its story, and it's why calling On Cinema a comedic movie review web series is almost as diminishing as calling Amazon a bookselling website. The starting point is the flagship, On Cinema at the Cinema. A simple web series in which a host and his guest review the weekend's new movies and give them a rating from one to five bags of popcorn. Five bags of popcorn? Five bags of popcorn and a uh, hundred more bags of popcorn. Wow. Five bags of popcorn and some cupped tubs of soda. I'm just going to do the five bags of popcorn because I think this was a missed opportunity. Three bags of popcorn. Three bags is not very many. Well, then I'm going to give it five bags of popcorn, two more bags of popcorn, which we can slide over. You can't slide bags of popcorn over. All right, fine. I'll give it five bags of popcorn. Well, you don't need to because I already gave it. If it moves, I'm going to have seven. It's best rating it's ever been. It's the best movie to get. Which it is. Three stars. Say I were to pick a random person off the street and force them to watch the first season of On Cinema and ask them to explain in their words why it's funny and what the joke is, so to speak. I'd imagine the thesis they would present would centrally involve the idea that these two people reviewing the movies, one of whom who claims to be the world's foremost film buff and expert, are maybe not too bright and don't actually know much of anything about anything. This general idea is conveyed in many ways, such as flubs and mispronunciations. Uh, Mary Ma Tyler, or very Mary uh, Louise Parker, directed by Bill Condom. Immediate contradictions that demonstrate the character's lack of actual convictions and perspective. You know how much I love remakes. Just another same old movie of a remake. All we do is remakes lately. Not a, not as good of a movie as I would have liked, but I gotta hand it to the director for making a great film. I really liked it. I give it five bags of popcorn. Misconceptions about the movies and actors. Ryan Reynolds, one of my favorite actors, Burt Reynolds' son. Lots of meaningless verbal wheel spinning. Film buffs should rejoice. As far as I know, and, and I do know these things, this is the first uh, biography of a known figure to use the full name as the title of the movie. So, a very, very complicated story for Smurfs to get involved with in this episode of Smurfs. Obviously not having even seen the movie. Joker from the Batman and Robin show from years ago. Played by, of course, Jack Nicholson. Now we have... Shining. Robert De Niro playing him. I didn't realize it was an animated movie. You know, yeah, so the technology is pretty getting clear I know, about but I'm one saying the second in. Nitpicks. When you've got Johnny Depp, the next call you make is to Tim Burton. Those two guys together with this Sherlock Gnomes movie, I think he would have hit it right out of the park. And so much bickering. You were never really here. Sounds like the Greg Turkington story. Get the money, they have, to leave. Be, they have to get Shut the up. budget somehow. I'll, I'll it's walk like you out. I'll have everybody, wa all of them walk you this out. The Greg Turkington's no longer part of the show. My first impression of this series so many years ago was of a hilarious, intentionally bad movie review show with surprisingly incredible acting, with lots of the jokes deriving from the host's discussions of the movies, the random films they choose to spotlight, the fact that nearly every film from The Hobbit to Fantastic Four is given the coveted five bags of popcorn, and the way it's all presented as a valuable resource to moviegoers, and yet provides almost nothing in the way of actual film criticism. Very funny stuff, and if this were all the show had to offer, I would absolutely still enjoy it. But I certainly wouldn't be making this video and telling you it's my favorite show of all time. I will be citing some key events and major storylines, so if you're concerned about spoilers, continue at your own discretion. The first few seasons largely stick to this simple concept. But what if I were to tell you that eventually these characters' lives relating to the show would be scrutinized in a near five-hour-long murder trial? Co-host on, uh, on cinema at the cinema. Objection. He is not a uh, host. He's a guest. What if I were to tell you that this show included multiple character deaths, failed businesses, at least four divorces, major lawsuits, betrayals, paralyzations, medical comas, conspiracy theories, countless public meltdowns, the bottling and selling of sewer water, Several cases of arson, hostage situations, suicide attempts, drug abuse, a reality competition for skin donation, and so much more. And what if I were to tell you that this story would be told through a complex web of several different mediums, from theatrical releases to arguments on Twitter between characters, 
and eventually a dedicated subscription service that's weaved into the narrative of the show. How is this possible in the confines of the concept that I've laid out, you ask? As the show goes on, the concept begins to open up wide, really wide. We gradually start to see Tim, the host, becoming less and less interested in talking about movies and bringing more and more discussion of his personal life into the on-cinema broadcast. We start to see the real story behind the scenes bleed into the review show format we've been watching, as he say, brings people from his personal life onto the show, promotes whatever schemes and business ideas he's involved in, or monologues at length about whatever his latest health problems are. Herein lies the true brilliance of this show's concept. The creators are then able to weave a truly compelling narrative through this weekly web broadcast by having the characters talk about and deal with the aftermath of whatever that past week's events were, and since the show is meant to be a live broadcast, things can go wrong and the real story as well as the real personalities of the characters can slip through. The story we see, beyond all the silliness and the mundane uselessness, is a soapy drama. It's a saga of mistakes and betrayals and accidents and manipulation, and it gets dark, in moments, really dark. This is one of my favorite aspects of the show because the contrast of the review format to the darkest moments of the series is so vast that it only strengthens the humor in both aspects. He's fighting for his life as we're speaking, I guess. At the talk movies. Because of this, you can always have the feeling that even though this is a movie webcast, anything can happen. As the show progresses, the overarching story bleeds into the other content that makes up this universe as well, which we'll get into later. Because the true plot of these characters in their universe is something we as an audience are not really supposed to be seeing within the confines of most of the content we see from them, this concept allows for some truly next level meta comedic storytelling. The format of week to week live broadcasts works comedically in terms of setting up character motivations one week and then cutting to the aftermath in the next episode. One week, Tim is blindsided live on air by the revelation that his wife is working for the man that infected his face with dirty acupuncture needles. Infection on my face, Dr. Sands needles. May he be found and arrested and prosecuted, put in jail for abuse of needles. Tim has been looking for this man, and the episode ends in an angry rampage live on air. Dr. Well, Sands is the most wanted man in America. Is Dr. Dr. Sands? You I, I didn't have anything to do with it. You're telling me my wife's working for Dr. Sands? Turn the lights off. Then the very next episode begins like this. We then get to catch up on what happened in the past week to lead to such a dramatic shift. This style of storytelling also works seamlessly within the context of On Cinema as a whole because it contributes to one of the core conflicts always at the center of its universe. Tim's desire to discuss his personal dramas, new businesses, political views, etc. I'm going to try to get through this without getting too emotional, but it's going to be a long show. It's, I don't know how much time we're even going to have for the movies, but let me just... Versus Greg's singular desire to talk at length about movies and only movies. If they tuned in to see movies reviewed, they're probably not going to. They're going to see irrelevant casino gambling. Uh, the reputation of this show is terrible because you don't talk about movies anymore. Well, because you I'm have trying to get to the movies. about YouTubers and TikTok. Um, thus sowing their creative differences in terms of the direction of the show. As Tim brings more personal business on the show, there's less time to talk about movies. And as Greg becomes more frustrated by that fact, their relationship strains and gives way to more and more conflict. I just want to give you guys an update of where I am uh, with my life. I know Greg doesn't want the show to be all about personalities, but people do want to know. More often than not, instead of actually seeing what happens, storylines are shown to us through the reactions of the characters and their own retellings of events skewed to how they view the world and how they feel about what's happening often stretching or bending the truth to their benefits. Because of this, the show is so deeply character-driven, and even a retelling of simple mundane events can have so many character implications to unpack. And the more you do unpack it, the funnier it all becomes. I mentioned earlier that its style of humor makes it hard to recommend to people. The reason for this is, at least partially, because the show that these characters are making in-universe is a bad, boring, useless show with lots of intellectual and critical posturing but no substance at all. On top of this, at least for the much more subtle first few seasons, it's played incredibly straight to the point where if you had no preconceptions and weren't paying close attention, you could potentially mistake it for sincere. So extensively, we in the real world are watching that bad, boring show. Therefore, it's easy to write it off as such. If you weren't looking at it through a lens of relishing the absurdity of the idea of a show like this with hosts like this existing and appreciating the note-perfect, subtly tongue-in-cheek performances that help sell the concept, but if you are, and you watch it with an awareness of that extra layer of meta-commentary on what these characters are presenting, you can start to see this show's brilliance. To explain what I mean by this, I'll bring us back to another example of a much broader comedy. While thinking about the spirit of On Cinema and what makes it stand out over other comedies in my prep for this video, a scene came to mind from an old episode of Family Guy, 
in which Peter Griffin is trying to toss a dead frog out of a window, but he doesn't want to touch it, so he uses a shoebox to try and scoop it up. For what seems like an eternity, we watch Peter struggle with this simple task, sometimes getting closer to getting the frog out of the window, but always dropping it every time until he finally does it, and then the momentum of the episode resumes as if nothing had happened. This is annoying to watch and tests the audience's patience, and that's essentially the joke. You're meant to laugh at how torturous this scene is and how ridiculous it is that the creators would have put this in and made it last so long. In On Cinema, there are often moments that can feel like this, many of them coming from Greg Turkington, who has an incredible ability to monotonously drone on at length about a movie with the pompous air of profundity whilst never saying anything remotely of substance at all. I think a good example for this point is an episode of the show from season 10, in which the entire episode is Greg droning on about several VHS tapes he has. Jumping in at this point, without the required context, a painfully boring and confounding 10 minutes that feels like it goes on forever. For me, one of the funniest videos on the internet. If you remove the humorous element of Greg Turkington's perfectly dry performance from this segment, you could argue that this and the Family Guy frog scene both have the same joke at their core. Boring, nothing premises that go on way too long, which is exactly the point. However, the context of the Family Guy scene is simply, Seth MacFarlane put this in his show as a gag that interrupts the episode. This episode of On Cinema, on the other hand, is deeply contextually layered. First off, we are seeing what the character of Greg sincerely believes is an interesting and valuable segment. In the Family Guy scene, the meta element of the humor would be simply that the audience is laughing at the fact that Seth MacFarlane put this in his show. With Greg's episode of On Cinema, there's an extra layer of meta humor because we are laughing at a fictional character's inclusion of this type of content and what it says about that character and his current position in the universe of this show. Behind this episode's existence is years of Greg arguing for more of these segments and his visions for the creative direction of the show, as well as a history of complex power struggles and the farcical extenuating circumstances that led to him even having the opportunity to make this episode his way in the first place. On top of that, we as an audience know Tim's feelings about these segments and their lack of value to the show. Tim is such a well-realized character, and we know his mind so well at this point in the series, that while we're watching Greg drone on and on, without Tim saying a single word, his voice is in our heads, and we understand exactly how he's feeling throughout, which makes whatever Greg is doing infinitely funnier. There's so much to unpack with this simple idea. With the proper context, it goes from haha, okay, I get it, it's funny because it's boring and it's going on a long time, to being a hysterically funny and multi-layered scene that perfectly encapsulates these two characters' relationship and their shifting power dynamics, as well as sets up a clear calm before the storm situation in which we know chaos will inevitably erupt. Compare this to the frog scene in Family Guy, a show which I also do love, by the way, at least for the first years of its run. Hopefully you can see my example of why On Cinema's style of meta-contextual humor is leaps and bounds above most anyone else doing something that would be described by many, I think rather reductively in the case of On Cinema, as anti-comedy. No matter how funny or not you may find a given gag on this show when looked at it in a vacuum, it's never that simple. There's always context. There are always layers of irony and character that reinforce it. It's comedy that challenges you as much as it rewards you becoming more and more hilarious upon revisiting after progressing and further understanding the characters and their world. I don't want to get too much into the actual plot of this series, I'll save that for another video. I first want to talk about another element at the core of this series that sets it above almost any other comedy for me. The characters and the performances. Moving beyond the central conceit, perhaps the most important aspect of this show's genius is its seriously amazing characters, their relationships to one another, and the absolute masterclass in comedic acting on display here. Let's start with Tim and Greg. Both deeply narcissistic and troubled people, often diametrically opposed and bound together by a bizarre and complex relationship. I know it's crazy to say given the concept of this show, but in my opinion, Tim and Greg are two of the best, most well-realized, interesting, and most importantly, truly hilarious characters in entertainment. First up, Tim is the creator and host of the show. My name is Tim Heidecker and welcome to the first episode of my new show, On Cinema, At The Cinema. He is often defined by his vanity and self-importance. Whatever gene that is that make you gifted musically, I got it uh, in, in spades. He is consistently self-centered and stubborn and has an unwavering belief in himself that constantly gets him in over his head. I was making On Cinema and the thought occurred to me, hmm, now maybe I can do as good a job, if not better, making movies and TV shows and things like this. I'd like to f announce the formation of my first ever band called Dekar. I'm running for district attorney of San Bernardino County. He rarely takes responsibility for his own actions. I'm a perfect person. 
the people around me are flawed. And constantly postures morally and politically, but has no real convictions. That problem has been evacuated. As a member of the pro-life community, I stand for those ideals. And you are a part of that situation. Choices have to be on the table because there was no way that I was going to be in that situation. Another core characteristic is his temper. Especially when drinking, he often loses it over seemingly benign things to hilarious effect. Tim's anger comes into focus in little moments here and there in the first few seasons. This ranges from Tim getting visibly frustrated with Greg. It's where they go back to San Francisco. I mean, it's not that hard to explain. No, to completely losing his temper on the live broadcasts. Shut it up! We don't need any of this shit anymore. Get out of here! The shut up, shut start. up. Fuck this! Get on the fuck out! He didn't disobey me, it's my fault. I'll fuck you up, Mark. First shark came up. What the fuck is your problem? I told you to sit down. Sit down! He can't see where he is! And he can't talk about where he is! Tim's true feeling towards movies, the central focus of the show that he himself created, is essentially indifference. Yet he outwardly presents a passion for them until his real attitude slips through, as it always does. Even as he's waxing poetic about Tom Cruise or Steven Spielberg or whatever, there's always something underneath his words that suggests he's being at least slightly disingenuous. This is portrayed brilliantly in Tim Heidecker's near-perfect performance. He portrays both a short-tempered, bullheaded dimwit and simultaneously the front-facing facade that his character puts up, and naturally slips back and forth between them in a way that feels so natural and is so captivating to watch. Since the Tim we see is nearly always hosting the show, we see his phony persona the most at first, and the show has so much fun with letting his true persona gradually slip through more and more as the show goes on, until he's eventually mask off, raging week to week, and only ever wants to talk about his own problems and schemes, and even begins constantly belittling and judging his other half Greg for his love of movies. That piece of shit here with his dumb bullshit movies. Watching movies like a loser. A man who sits around watching movies all day. These sleepless in Seattle Hobbit movies. At this point, we begin to see Tim resenting the very concept of his own show. Because all he ever really wanted was to be at the center of attention. And it was never about a love of movies at all. Getting to the reviews becomes almost a chore in the way of what he really wants to do. And Greg to him represents that impedance in many ways. He gets mixed up in conspiracy theories and schemes that get him into trouble and cause him to lose control of the show and lose his cool as a host. We see him fluctuate from the self-centered alpha host to truly pathetic and hopeless in lower moments and back again. Uh, my guest today is one of the guests we've haven't had on the show before is Greg Turkington. Hey guys. Greg, on the other hand, is a man that's singularly obsessed with movies. Hey guys, it's movie time. He's so obsessed that it's all he can ever talk about and becomes agitated any time the subject shifts. Greg is the other half of the duo, and is an equally stubborn and fundamentally confused person. The difference is, while Tim is obsessed with his own status, career, intelligence, body of work, and general image, Greg is obsessed with his own knowledge of movies and his status as a film expert. 501 movies in 501 days. That's my record. This is my area of expertise. Greg is obsessed with talking about movies and yet has no conception of what makes a good movie, and almost no ability to recognize quality subtextually or otherwise. He hysterically obsesses over things like The Hobbit and James Bond and produces pointless segments for the show that highlight random old movies that no one would ever care about. I just don't know how many people want to see every location from Oh God. I think a lot do. One of his defining characteristics is his stubbornness and complete inability to admit when he's wrong. His ego with regard to his film expertise is so huge that even when he's proven wrong, he cannot accept it. A segment called Stump the Buff, in which Tim asks Greg movie trivia questions to raise money for charity, is a great example of how character-driven every corner of this show is. Greg cannot accept when he answers incorrectly, and will spin every incorrect answer to Tim being wrong or the question being unclear, while Tim clearly relishes in the fact that he is struggling. Oh, uh, it's 13. I'm official... counting the decade the way a decade goes, which is from 1981 to 1990. Your answer would be wrong, no matter what. He is eternally close-minded in the sense that he resists any change. He's a VHS purist, and even when Tim buys him a Blu-ray player, he rejects the technology completely. Does it have a VHS uh, input as well? He curates an archive of videotapes and goes so far as to tape new releases off the TV onto blank tapes since VHS is a dead format, a fact that he refuses to accept or admit. Where Tim is a blunt force instrument in the way he stands up for himself, Greg, while very easily triggered, is very much passive aggressive, which adds to the hilarity of the pair's dynamic. While he's not as outwardly crazy or awful as Tim, he's by no means the straight man of the pair. He's not in any way meant for the audience to relate to or side with. In fact, as the series goes on, you may find you agree equally with both characters' criticisms of each other. 
though they're both completely unable to turn the mirror on themselves or accept what the other is saying. Still, Greg is generally more often on the right side morally than Tim. He's still often dishonest though, self-obsessed, and an entirely immature person. Throughout the show, both of these characters go through a lot. Their relationship is strained in countless ways. One of my favorite storylines from the show begins with the reveal that Greg has been cast for a scene in the movie Ant-Man. You're in a movie with this f***ing guy, with Paul Rudd? And Tim's jealous outrage at this. Zero bags of popcorn for all Peyton Reed's movies, because he thought better than to cast me in that Ant-Man crap. Greg Turkin is going to fall flat on his face. I don't want any on cinema family members to see that crap. In retaliation, Tim goes and gets a role in the Fantastic Four movie. And this all leads to an episode of the show in which both of these movies are being discussed. These characters are so codependent, yet simultaneously so often at odds and so self-obsessed, that they are often in bitter competition with one another, which is thinly veiled, though they try to play nice. Here's a snippet of Tim's review of Ant-Man. Keep in mind that it's exceedingly rare for Tim to give any movie less than five bags of popcorn. Ant-Man, it was a disaster. One of the worst movies I've ever seen. Real trash. Shame on every person involved, including the actors, even the small parts. Every member of the cast was... Horrible. A horrible, horrible movie. Ant-Man. Now, let's look at Greg's review of the Fantastic Four. I liked it quite a bit. I completely understand why you would want to be involved with it, why you would pay the $15,000 to get that cameo right, in the movie. For your Fantastic Four lines. You one of the things they do with movies is now is that you can pay you can to be talk. in a movie in a cameo yeah, that's enough role. Of the, show. the conflict surrounding these two films continues on through the show as a running point of contention between Tim and Greg of which there are several. Want to work with Tim again so you can get another $10,000? The wiring, the the Josh, $10,000. I was paid to be in it, correct? No. Yeah, uh, we're, I, need to, I need clarity on that. Their relationship is complex because they often seem to hate each other, as the show goes on, are more and more antagonistic in significant ways, but they care about each other so much that they're constantly drawn back into each other's worlds. Their self-centered, narcissistic obsessions almost morph in a way to include each other's. Even when, spoiler alert, Tim is representing himself during the trial for his role in the death of 20 people at a music festival he created, he specifically takes the time to use his position in the courtroom questioning people that are under oath to settle a long-standing argument with Greg about Star Trek. Which Star Trek movie takes place in San Francisco? Your answer would be... In this moment, Tim is literally more focused on proving Greg wrong about the filming location of a Star Trek movie than proving himself innocent of murder. Greg even testifies against Tim in the trial, and when it's over, they're right back to working with one another because they're always drawn back into each other's orbits. In Mr. America, a feature-length documentary chronicling Tim's campaign for district attorney of San Bernardino, there's a scene in which Tim is speaking in a town hall-style event, and Greg shows up in the audience. His mere presence throws Tim into a frenzy that completely derails the entire event. Greg has this effect on him, and yet, when the movie comes out, there they are together again, reviewing this very movie and agreeing about its faults. It is a fascinatingly codependent and mutually manipulative relationship that, while often destructive, does work in both of their favors quite often. Their relationship as a focus point of the entire series grounds it in a way that allows space for a lot of the silliness around it to feel believable. There are even moments of true friendship between them that shine through, further complicating an ever-changing relationship full of extremes between two complicated, incredibly difficult, and in many ways profoundly unlikable people that is as captivating to follow as it is truly hilarious to watch. They are linked by their desire to create, however self-serving their individual motives are, and they both recognize their dependence on each other to make that happen. I think by focusing so heavily on the negative aspects of these characters, I may make them sound one note. But this is not the case. There is always a return to civility and posturing after one of their signature blowouts, and there are many different sides to these characters that make their lowest moments all the more hilarious because the characters feel so real. All of this great character writing is only as strong as the performances, and both Tim Heidecker and Greg Turkington's performances in the show are absolutely perfect. They both have the ability to make almost anything they are saying funny with a simple, dopey sincerity to everything. Look at the TV show Decker, an interconnected adult swim show that was written by and stars the characters of Tim and Greg from the On Cinema universe. Tim Heidecker's character on this show is therefore twice removed. He is not Tim Heidecker playing Jack Decker, he's Tim Heidecker playing Tim Heidecker playing Jack Decker. Watching that show, you can literally see from moment to moment the fictional character of Tim slipping through as he struggles to act and fumbles his lines. Otherwise, the whole country is going to be in problems. This is not easy to do, and is truly an impressive example of multi-layered comedic acting. 
My name is W.C. Piao. This droid reminds me of the late, great W.C. Fields. His inventor must have been a no, movie No, we're not buff. talking about that. Though it may seem to the uninitiated like a simple, dumb, goofy character, what Tim Heidecker is doing here is very specific, and very specifically contributes to the story of On Cinema and our understanding of its characters. The same goes for Greg Turkington's portrayal of Agent Kington. What is it? Can't you see I'm watching a movie? He's so clearly coming from a place of how his character would portray this other character, and that's what makes Kington so much more funny to those who know Greg so well. Go to the ocean there. Two weeks of popcorn classics and five baggers, how could I not? Beyond Tim and Greg, there's an incredible cast of supporting characters that are integral to the narrative as well. <laughs> potatoes! Potatoes! Joe Estevez is a C or D list movie star that is brought onto the show as one of the very first non-Greg guests and throughout the show is always paraded out as if he was the greatest movie star to ever have lived. He's a hilarious character because he's endlessly agreeable and consistently goes along with Tim and Greg's nonsense. His involvement in and endorsement of the on cinema properties as someone enough on the outskirts to know better only highlights the absurdity of this universe. His storyline and relationships with the other characters is characteristically deep as well. You are a mess and so is your life. Okay, thank you. Oh, this isn't your show. Yeah, but this is important that you it hear isn't. this. You write it? I, I wrote this well, because from the be heart, important. Tim. He is loyal to the point that he stands by Tim after his arrest and sticks around even after Tim has forced him to play CFO for his so-called media company and saddles the blame of its failures on him. This is almost a running theme in this universe. All of the people in Tim's orbit, Greg, Joe, his band members Axiom and Manuel, his multiple wives throughout the show's run, his conspiracy theorist security advisor Michael Matthews, these people are consistently in various ways slighted, abused, let down, and even injured for their associations with him, but he always has a way of bringing them back. You could argue Tim's relationships are almost all manipulative and even abusive, as no matter how much he wrongs the people around him, and how much they say they are done with him. I want nothing to do with them, so I'm not gonna go. They're always drawn back in. Alrighty then! Mm. Smoking! Take Mark Prokes, for example. Mark Prokes, I'm gonna be reading Amos's part. Amos's part. Um, I died in 1975. Mark is one of my all-time favorite on-cinema characters. First appearing on the second annual Oscar special, he's introduced to us as a celebrity impersonator, doing terrible impressions of W.C. Fields, Robin Williams, Mae West, Come up and see me sometime, boys! Charlie Chaplin, and more. He is, hilariously, subject to Tim's drunken verbal abuse on that very same broadcast. Mark, if you're gonna do Chaplin, do, say something. I Come with a bag of tricks, but make them tricks we can use. Okay, sorry Tim. And this manner of treatment is par for the course as the series progresses. He's a bumbling, awkward, untalented, not so bright person that Tim and Greg regularly platform as being a world-class entertainer. One of the most entertaining aspects of this setup that is used hilariously throughout the show's run is playing with Tim's short fuse and attention span as the introduction is always positive but gives way to anger and abuse directed towards Mark and sudden negative attitudes towards his performance. Mark Proach is going to be joining us. Yeah, I'm excited about that. He's very talented. Uh, this is Quint from Jaws you're doing. He talks like this, like a pirate. Why can't you talk like a fucking pirate? All right, thanks Mark, thank you. Thank you. Should Mark return for the fifth annual? My vote is no. The story of Mark's involvement with Tim and Greg is one of the darker and more tragic aspects of the show as well, as he's consistently physically injured to the point where he's put into a coma for a full year and awakens with permanently diminished mental faculties. The on cinema. I, uh, I do remember, um, um, way, way back. Mark is so often the rope in Tim and Greg's tug of war match. He's made the star of Greg's segments, which Tim hates and cancels, verbally abusing Mark in the process. He's made the waiter for Tim's dine-in movie theater concept, which Greg hates, leading him to verbally abuse Mark as well. Don't come back, Mark. It's Don't. not my fault, Greg. He's used by Greg as Tim's replacement in his unaired finale of the prematurely canceled Decker vs. Dracula in spite of Tim, which leads to more abuse. I saw that fucking tape of you, Mark! You fucking asshole! You, you, you tried to make yourself look like Decker! and you're gonna pay for it. You get the picture. It almost becomes a game of keep away in which Tim and Greg compete to have Mark under their thumb in some way, to the detriment of Mark. Even his coma becomes about Tim and Greg's relationship problems. Whose fault it was, who got him out of it, eventually leading to an investigation into Medicare fraud and Greg's care of Mark after the incident. 
During the trial, one of the best moments is Mark's testimony as Tim threatens him from the sidelines, leading to an outburst during Tim's cross-examination. I'm getting a little purpose, frustrated with the, the witness purpose, right now, I'm Mr. Judge. Fresh. I have the constitutional right to strike him if he dis disobeys me. Tim is so wrapped up in these people that are in his life that even after something like this that should end any relationship in its tracks, they are always brought back under Tim's wing with new kinds of leverage. These side characters, of which there are so many more that I haven't even mentioned, allow for the story to go to some truly crazy and often hilariously dark places. There's such a great cast of people that can be set up to absorb the effects of the insane messes Tim and Greg create for them. Tim forcing his guitar player Manuel to lie under oath at his trial leads him to go into hiding in Italy. Greg employing Mark to sell bootlegged videotapes gets Mark arrested and jumped in prison, after which he goes missing for quite some time. The story of the show is just fantastic. We see real arcs with characters and their relationships. We see major events like character deaths and divorces and how everyone around them deals with them, and how they affect everything that's happening, down to the reviews of the movies themselves. There are so many insane and dramatic story beats as the show goes on that elevate the show into the realm of brilliance. And remember, all of this stuff is being weaved into the series organically amongst movie review segments on a weekly web series. Well, not exactly. This brings me to the final reason I want to talk about for why On Cinema is so unique and brilliant. We've talked about the general concept and style of humor and the amazing characters and performances on display, but what makes On Cinema so unique is the way it tells its story across a variety of mediums and makes it organic by tying them into the story itself. The story of this universe is told not just through On Cinema, but also through the characters' tweets, six seasons of a show called Decker, a feature-length theatrically released movie, audio podcasts, blog posts, and more, including eventually a multimedia platform with tons of unique content created as a way of funding the show in the real world, but weaved brilliantly into the story of the show. The first few seasons of On Cinema were pretty self-contained. The movie review concept pretty much carries the entire first and most of the second season. Even before this, the show started with audio podcasts that are referenced on the show. As the web series aired, Tim and Greg's Twitter accounts would fill in blanks between episodes during the weeks, tweeting as their characters. There are countless examples for this for nearly every episode of the show, so I'll pick one kind of at random. There's an episode where Greg's segment inadvertently spoils the ending of Decker, and Tim rages. Shit. F Anyone who went to Twitter after the episode aired would get pleased not to watch the segment, updates on rewriting the ending, arguments between the two characters, and an apology from Greg. There are so many examples of parts of the story being enhanced and sometimes filled in by supplemental materials released by the characters themselves. Speaking of what the characters are releasing, we've talked a bit about Decker already, but this really marks the first departure from the mainline on cinema series into other corners of the universe. What's so brilliant about the Decker series is that it's a real show you can watch without having seen on cinema and still laugh at it as a spy parody. It's possible that you may not even know that it is a series created by, produced by, and starring fictional characters and what happens in the show directly reflects and references what the characters are doing in-universe at the time of its creation. It even directly connects to the story in hilarious ways. Greg's initial involvement is a great example. Tim comes to Greg with a segment in which he's asked to sit in front of a green screen for an interview, wearing a suit, which Greg finds odd but agrees to. He asks questions about Greg's proprietary VHS coding system and uses the clips to cut together a scene about a CIA codebreaker for Decker. It is hilarious, and without seeing this interview scene on On Cinema, you could watch Decker and the scene would still be funny at face value. But when you understand where this came from, and when you revisit On Cinema next week and see the aftermath of Greg's angry reaction to it, it all becomes so much more hilarious. This is one of thousands of examples of how properties in this universe connect brilliantly for comedic effect. Another great example on the topic of Decker is a storyline in which Tim gives Greg the reins to write and direct Season 3 of Decker, Decker vs. Dracula. We watch on cinema and get updates about the production and everything that's happening. And then we watch the first three episodes of Decker vs. Dracula week to week, concurrently with the on cinema broadcasts, and get reactions and understanding the capacity of their work and the series and their feelings about it. Then Tim suddenly cancels the series and accuses Greg of ruining Decker, and a giant fight ensues. Blatant disrespect for America. You're the one that shits all over it when you show up to set with a dyed black beard, so Shut you up! to film them. Hey! Shut up or I'll punch you in your mouth. Then we get YouTube videos that are put out by Tim and Greg respectively, chronicling their own experiences with the troubled production. Tim releases a behind the scenes tape that seeks to discredit Greg and show him not only being a bad director, but why he ruined the franchise. And Greg releases a response tape and produces his own version of the finale with Mark Proch as a stand in for Tim's character. The whole saga is told not only through the on cinema broadcasts, but through actual episodes of Decker vs. Dracula, which 
by the way, are hilarious even without all of this context, as well as tweets from the characters and the behind the scenes documentaries and lost scenes both of the characters release. This is a truly unique and interactive style of storytelling that I can't even think of a good comparison for. You feel like these characters are real people in the world releasing content and using social media just like anyone else would. They even interact in the comments on this content with the fan base that adds their own takes. For all the other seasons of Decker, since the character of Tim is meant to be writing it, there are hilarious and revealing tie-ins to whatever scheme or venture Tim is involved with. For example, at a certain point in the show, Tim becomes involved with what he and his crackpot doctor business partner Dr. San call nutritional vaping. He's constantly vaping and talking about vaping and its benefits on the show, on cinema that is. Then, the next week you tune into Decker and see an episode in which Tim's character is dead and revived and healed completely by Dr. San blowing vape clouds all over his body. I use non-traditional methods. Another example, when Tim forms his band Dakar, he starts to make episodes of Decker where he casts his bandmates and makes them all about his character playing music and being in a band band meeting. I am a CIA agent, and our gig is actually a secret op to stop a terrorist attack. Again, watching Decker without this context is still a very funny show, but it's so much more than that because it's another way you interface with these characters and where they are at in their lives and what's important to them. It goes the other way too, as events in Decker connect back to the main show as well. At one point, there's a storyline in Decker involving Greg's videotapes having enemy spy bugs in them. The scene involves Tim burning all of the tapes and actually uses Greg's real collection. This causes a rift between the two on the show and sets up another major through line involving Greg's video archive company and several subsequent cases of suspected arson, which I'll leave to discuss for another time. All of this content, however, is content in which the characters are creating and releasing it, so they have control over the narrative and what the audience sees. These projects are all framed by whatever Tim or Greg want you to see. The trial of Tim Heidecker was the first time we were seeing a whole event outside of the character's control, as it's meant to be a court TV type of recording, and therefore comes from a neutral perspective. Same goes for the movie Mr. America, which was released by Magnolia Pictures in theaters. This is a documentary about Tim's revenge run for District Attorney of San Bernardino, which Greg has tried his best to hijack by following the producers and inserting himself into filming sessions to talk about movies. In universe, this film is directed by an outside filmmaker named Josh Lorton, and therefore is out of the control of Tim and Greg. Both characters then, for weeks of on cinema leading up to its release, talk about what the movie will be like, and then when it comes out, we get to see Tim and Greg review the movie and discuss how the director made them look and what their problems with the movie are. You see the movie that I specifically tell Josh he can't, what he can and can't use. This movie is another example of a project that works on its own, but when you're watching the surrounding discussion related to the movie and its production from the characters in the movie on another show, knowing their hopes and insecurities and how they want to be portrayed and seeing their reaction to it, it's just brilliant. It's worth mentioning that even the side characters get involved with this type of storytelling as well. Of course, they are all eventually cast on Decker at some point or another, but Tim enlists them to all make shows of their own. Through this, we get Rock House, an MTV VH1 style reality show starring the members of Tim's band, a movie related show called The Popcorn Shuffle, six episodes of an investigative conspiracy theory show called Exposed starring Tim's security advisor and QAnon nutjob Michael Matthews and featuring just about everyone else on the cast, and Mark's cavalcade of characters, which just take a look for yourself. Alpha Alpha, what is the name of your group? We're the R-Gang. Lollipop? Do you want some? Thank you! Yay. I could honestly talk about Decker, Greg's movie Deck of Cards, and the other content these characters make as companion pieces to On Cinema and their connections at length. And maybe I'll make another video on just that. But for now, let's move on. Even though this video is long already, I haven't even scratched the surface of everything there is to talk about with this show. So I'm considering doing some more deep dive videos on specific aspects. For example, just talking about Tim's band Dakar and the entire insane saga that unfolds around it, which I haven't really gotten into at all. I definitely want to make a video about Tim's trial because it's a five hour long court TV recording that I believe to be the magnum opus of this show. And there's just too much to talk about there for this video. But as a last few points with regard to how this show brilliantly plays with mediums, I think a great example is when, in season 10, Tim goes to Best Buy and meets a worker there who he has on the show to talk about VR. He then announces the show will only be in VR starting next week. Get the unit, because next week we're throwing out all the cameras here. Can here. you watch it the regular way too? You cannot. It'll be in VR. Prepare, because that's the future. We're not waiting around for it. This is funny for so many reasons, because the format of the show does not in any way call for virtual reality. 
This change is alienating most of the audience, and Greg argues these points. Then, the next few episodes really are broadcasted in VR. They are awkwardly hilarious episodes of the show that are not easily accessible to most everyone watching. This is an example of how brilliantly interactive this series is. In a normal show, a character makes a decision like this, you see it fail, haha, funny, etc. In this show, the character's bad decision directly affects your ability to watch the show in the real world as intended. As Greg argues the point that no one will be able to watch it properly, he's arguing on your behalf as you are that audience, once removed by one layer of insanely meta comedy. Just take a look at the discussion on Twitter between Tim and Greg after the first VR episode. Greg even puts up a poll that we as audience members voted on for the format of the show, with VR belonging in a garbage can winning out over on a movie review show. As the story takes a turn, the medium as well as the power dynamic between Greg and Tim shifts dramatically and we as an audience are along for the ride. The final episode in this VR run features a dramatic monologue as Tim is broke and out of options, hopeless and brought to his knees, ready to give up on the show and potentially his own life in general. The fact that this depressing meltdown happens in the ridiculous close-up VR shot is just so perfect and ironic. We watch this broken, defeated man explaining he has nothing left into a VR camera that he has to return to Best Buy after the broadcast, after just two weeks prior diving headfirst into this completely unnecessary and unwarranted medium change, so excitedly and even hiring the guy who sold it to him at Best Buy. I have zero left. It's one of my all-time favorite moments on the show because whether you're watching the broken warped video conversion, which is the joke, or actually watching it in a VR headset, it's something that truly could only happen on this show. The final topic I want to mention briefly with regard to the creative ways this show presents its story to us through different mediums actually came about from Adult Swim's cancellation of the show in real life. The season leading up to the shift established Tim's latest new persona as that of a CEO, financial expert, and businessman. Movies and money. Can't go, can't do anything without money. There's so much gold in that storyline alone, as he gets in deep with a predatory lending company, absorbs a major lawsuit, and takes on copious amounts of debt. There's even an episode that is an emergency board meeting about the state of the company in which his trusty board gives him insights like this. We gotta find a solution to figure out how to get out of that. Well, I second that. I mean, we, we, need, a, we need a solution. Yeah. This sets everything up organically for the next natural step in the progression of the series to be the formation of the high network. Tim's subscription-based multimedia network. No longer being funded by Adult Swim, Tim Heidecker switched to an independent subscription model for the newer on cinema content in order to keep the show going. Not the first of its kind, I guess, though I can't think of a comparable example. What's brilliant is how the show mines this concept for humor. We're live on the high by incorporating it seamlessly into the story. Here we are, the audience in the real world, subscribing to this great website, while the story of the show is all about Tim's hilarious evolution from CEO of On Cinema Properties to CEO of The High Network, and all that comes with this concept. High Inc. is a multi-platform corporation that serves as a holding company for the portfolio of intellectual properties and brands under the Heidecker uh, Properties concept. His contract negotiations with Greg, a mysterious and shady businessman who's intimately involved with its inception, Tim's invention of a new cryptocurrency called High Points, for which the website is also a real working trading platform for this fake currency, and so much more. Key parts of the story are included in the regularly updated news section of the site, which allows Tim to post his poorly written opinion pieces and company updates. This new format allows for so much extra content as well, as we see the characters strive to build out the programming of this network, which is where we get gems like the Highlight Season episodes and Greg's original movie Deck of Cards. All of this is so brilliantly incorporated into the story. It itself influences the characters and their decisions and the things they choose to focus on. As I write this, there's such a massive amount that I feel I haven't even touched on. And there's so much more I have to say about this amazing series. So I'm thinking about making a series of maybe shorter videos about certain topics relating to this show. So please let me know if anyone out there would be interested in seeing something like that. I wanted to start with this long, deep dive into the aspects of the show that I appreciate so much. And though my mind wandered quite a bit along the way, I think I got there and laid it out for you. So please, I urge you to give this show a try. It's absolutely brilliant and hilarious, and only gets funnier as the layers of its in-universe context become more clear, and you become more invested in these amazing characters. You delve into the story and appreciate the one-of-a-kind way in which it tells it. I give this series five bags of popcorn and a little subscribe button that you can hit if you enjoyed this video.